guys welcome back to the purpose podcast where we talk about all the reasons why we do the jobs we do every single day um as you guys know we're joined by someone special every week who brings a different story and a different discussion to the table and this week i'm joined by kevin henney who is a all-round thought provoker uh lifetime coder and has been a keynote speaker on several different talks in the software engineering space over the years and he has been so kind as to join me on this week's episode of the podcast to talk about all the reasons why he does the job he does every single day and helps the people that he does help every day. Um, so, Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time to join me this week on the podcast. I won't. I don't want to take too much from the horse's mouth, as so to speak. Um, so, I'd love to hear a bit about yourself, your background, and yeah, we can take it from there. Right. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, Rich. Um, so, who am I? Uh, story so far. Um, so, yeah, I, I work for myself. Um, I guess whenever I'm asked to fill in a form put in software development consultant um, and that covers a multitude of sins um, everything from actual software development to helping people software uh, develop software I guess these days I'm probably more uh, in the helping mode uh, although I still write code um, I tend to find that I do training workshops and uh, kind of help people see things that they might not otherwise see uh, or know things that might otherwise pass them by um, so I guess that's that. That's what I do now. And what does that um, and obviously from a coding perspective, where do you where where does your specialism come from? Where is where is it developed and where does it help people today? Um, well, it's one of those things. I ended up doing this because I I kind of finished university with a physics degree and absolutely no sense of direction. Um, and then, but one of the things I knew I enjoyed and I'd enjoyed it whilst doing that, but also when I've been um, uh, at home as a hobbyist, um, coding. I quite liked this. And something that had started really interesting me was possibilities of computers. And I had an interest in AI, um, although that's not the path that I ended up taking. Um, all of this kind of had me refocus my gaze onto software development. And a job came up. Um, and I kind of stuck with it and started realizing actually there was a whole load of stuff I really enjoyed. And it was actually a lot of the coding stuff. It was perhaps less the, uh, the seemingly sounding cool stuff uh, and more the ways we think and organize um, software code and the way we approach uh, problem solving um, mm. uh, as well as communication. So that kind of set me on that whole path. Uh, I ended up eventually working for myself um, and the kind of the path to that was uh, one of my kind of job transitions was to a company that did training and consultancy and having done just kind of like been in the back room doing the development uh, uh, coding things up I felt I needed a change uh, what was I going to do with all this stuff that I'd learned but I also felt really frustrated with work environments I think that is one of the most um difficult things uh, in that sense is seeing beyond your, you know, where you acquired the knowledge, what else can you do with it? And was it just going to be coding? And I could see that based on the companies that I worked for, mm -hmm. this might not, might not be the path I wanted to end up in. Uh, but I had all this knowledge and I really liked doing certain things. And it's just like, well, how do I do, how do I turn that around? And it turns out training consultancy was the path that um, I, I pursued that, you're still involved in this, but you get to look at it from another side. And I discovered being a team leader, but also writing um, writing articles. Uh, I started writing articles a very long time ago. Um, uh, I liked that kind of exposition, explanation. I always found that when I had to try and explain something, um, either to the page uh, or to another human, I normally end up with a new insight. In fact, I've learned, probably learned more by having to frame ideas for other people uh, whether directly in a teaching role uh, or in writing, um, uh, explaining in just a general conversation. I've probably learned more that way than just through the more direct medium uh, uh, that you'd expect to learn from. So that kind of is how I ended up doing that. And I've worked for myself basically this century, I think uh, would be the, the, the easiest way. Of, uh, let's, round, let's round the numbers a bit. Um, <laughs> and that's, that's, again, has kind of involved me um, traveling around a lot. Uh, mm -hmm giving talks. Uh, these days I sit at, <laughs> I sit at home and give talks. Um, um, and again, that idea of um, communication and having to frame your thoughts um, 
you actually benefit from that as well you know as a person you how do I communicate yeah. how do I explain this which seems so incredibly clear in my head the minute it comes out of your mouth it's just like well that wasn't as good an idea as I thought or that's a much better explanation or way of approaching that than I had previously appreciated um so there's a kind of like a feedback loop there so I, I kind of get a, get a buzz out of it um you know perhaps slightly less of a buzz sitting in front of um a, a, a computer's camera uh, than uh, in front of a group of people but there's still a feedback loop there yeah it's quite interesting because there's two threads that I kind of took from that one of them which was uh writing it down and be able to relay it to someone that's like so I've noticed as well I'm I always get told you should write things down and, and you see see it differently. And sometimes I'm just there like, uh, I don't see it. I sometimes don't see this point, but there is moments where you have like, yeah. green, as it's called, as I like to call it, green light moments where you're like, yeah. you see it straight away, but then you rethink it and you come at a different approach and, you know, it's there, it's presented in front of you and you've gone, wow, okay, this can take us to X, Y, Z. And and yeah. this, this is the beauty of coding as well, is this, that there's, there's, there's an infinite amount of solutions to a to a problem at hand and there's an infinite amount of ways to do it as well yeah and i th i think that's very that's very very true so therefore you can never have enough perspectives in fact one of the things that i one of the things i learned um one of the things i enjoy mm. um is in the past when i've gone to conferences um but also uh you know just reading blog posts and things online is going to sessions on things that in theory i already know in fact i've done this not just in the software realm um uh, a number of years ago i got into writing uh, short fiction and i went to lots of beginners classes um <laughs> repeatedly because one of the things that i learned is that you will never uh, somebody else will never know something the same way that you know it so even though something might be marked as hey this is introductory or hey, you know isn't this your isn't this your topic it's like yeah it is, but I've taken a particular path through it. Unless the topic is really, really tiny, um, I've taken a particular path through it. So the person who's speaking to me, if they are, if they're going to, they're going to have taken a different path. They're going to have seen something different on the way. Even though we brand for convenience things as being introductory, um, uh, intermediary, advanced, these are uh, the world doesn't actually live according to these labels. These labels are for for marketing, and they are convenient tags but they're not actually real. Um, it turns out that what may be introductory to you is actually quite advanced for somebody else because they didn't have the benefit of your particular experience mm -hmm. or in a particular field, something's moved on and um, you, you entered it at a particular point, you go back to what is now considered introductory and it's actually fresh, it's new, it's quite different to what you were, uh, uh, what you were introduced to or your previous experience. So I find that actually going to things where in theory I already know it, I always learn from that because, you know, personally, they, somebody else will show me a different, you know, a di not just a different piece of the landscape. They'll actually show me a different path. They will think about it differently. They will use different metaphors, um, little different rules of thumb or, you know, different just throwaway remarks. Oh, I always do this. Or, I, you know, uh, here's the thing I learned. It's just like, well, wow, I didn't know that. Um, and so just actually, it's kind of like shading something in. You can shade it in very approximately, but you can still go back. There's still gaps. You can yeah. always fill that uh, through. And it just gives you that slightly firmer, more solid ground. And I guess also from my role, as I, I consider communication to be part of what I do, hearing somebody else's way of communicating what mm. to me is a familiar idea, it, it shows it from a different point of view. I might sit there and go, I've never thought about it like that. You know, that's, that doesn't just help me that I'm, I can probably pass that on to somebody else. Maybe that will help them. Um, so yeah, I, I tend to think that that, that idea the, that is the writing it down, but also hearing yourself say something, but also hearing somebody else say something that in theory, you know, already actually mm -hmm. guess what you just learned something. Exactly. And it's, it's also the, um, I think the experience point that you've touched on there as well is so vital in that, you know, there's my job that I do every single day, there is 39,000 other agencies out there in the UK alone that are doing what we, well, they say, well, it's across the board, but for reference to the yeah. conversation, it's, you know, no one has the background I have, or I'd be surprised to meet someone who did um, with all the experiences to date that I've had, uh, which we have discussed in previous conversations. It's like to, to be wanting to be in the army from a young age and then do it, worked at a go-kart circuit when I was in my young teens, um, and that was an experience in itself, done some incredible stuff with them and did, did a lot of bits with F1 um, and 
then dabbled in. Oh, where did I go from there? I just, it just changed all the time. Ski season, as yeah. uh, I was a slope medic, and then into the super yacht industry, and now we're here now. And they're all different experiences that have informed who I am today. And you can't sit there and, you know, dovetail and say, oh, this person's better at it for the X or this is person's better at it for Y. The experiences inform who you are and the job you do every single day. And that's the mm. most vital bit of it. Um, and obviously in the work you do in, as a cons- in the consultancy space, there's, you're, you're meeting new people every single day. You're, you're faced with different challenges all the time. Um, obviously, you wake up every day with a new challenge. So my, my question to you is what pushes you mm. to help others through those challenges? Um, well, okay, there's the very pragmatic thing. I work for myself, so therefore <laughs> there's, a, there's an inevitable driver there. Um, but it does mean there's, there's a kind of another positive point that there's a kind of sense of obligation uh, to myself. Um, but there's another another perspective there, which is that uh, I have a certain amount of choice. It's, you know, we, we, um, a certain amount of choice in what I, I do. It, you know, I am in that sense my own boss. And if I occasionally I kind of look back and say, well, what is it that characterizes my work? Why do I do this? What's my motivation in this? And some years I will say, actually, I'm not quite sure what the answer to that question is. But at other times, it is that idea of um, sometimes there is a problem to be solved. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's that that kind of, uh, I think, one of the interesting uh, ideas in software development uh, there's always this question: what, what makes a good software developer? Uh, uh, and I, I don't think there's a simple single answer. Um, but normally, when people try and pigeonhole in terms of careers, the, the easy option is: oh, well, you know, you need to be good at, uh, at maths or something like that. And it's like actually, kind of the kind of maths that gets used in in software development is not the kind of maths that you're normally taught at school. Um, uh, and it can kind of help, but that's only a fraction of it. And some people regard programming as a very mathematical thing. Um, yeah, that's not actually really true. It can be viewed as that, but a view is not the whole. In other words, it's like, yeah. you know, it, it's, it's like looking at a side view of a building. That doesn't give you the whole building. It's a truth, but it's not the whole truth. Um, uh, there's this idea of people being technically minded. Again, that doesn't seem to capture it. And when I look around at uh, what I see in terms of people and their backgrounds, because people end up in software development from all over the place. Um, uh, you know, it's, they, they end up there from, um, uh, you know, it's fairly, it's fairly stere- stereotypical. There'll be people who have software engineering and computer science degrees. And then there will also be people who've come in from other sciences. Uh, sometimes, you know, oh yeah, I trained as a chemist. And then I was working with, software when i was doing my yeah. work and then i ended up transitioning you know there's sometimes that story um yeah. i find other people who've gone complete different paths um uh, uh you know they, they kind of had a focus on on history or the arts uh, or languages um but natural languages not programming and they end up there and so for me what i find is that the one thing that i've been able to consistently find is that normally there is some element in there of people like to uh, you know Good software developer, you want to solve problems. There's somewhere in there, there's a problem solver. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is normally creativity. Mm-hmm. These two things, that for me is more consistent as an indicator of that. Now, from my point of view, in terms of when it comes to helping other people, it's like, okay, the, uh, these are two things that I quite like um, the idea of uh, problem solving. Not all problems are easily solved or can be solved in just one way, as you mentioned. But there's the idea of that actually that kind of journey itself is probably interesting. You're going to learn something from it. That what that's what makes it exciting. Um, there's a certain unpredictability to it, uh, but also being able to use your previous experience. That's always kind of that, that kind of lights lights something up, uh, either in you or in somebody else. And they go, oh, wait a minute, this is like exactly. And there's the other side, which is creativity. Um, uh, working in something where you are effectively creating something new that potentially hasn't existed in the world before or has not existed like that. That's quite exciting. Yeah. Or the other thing, um, which going back to kind of our opening thoughts, uh, that the idea of just learning something or seeing something from a completely different angle, I find that uh, that's my normal, that's my kind of normal kind of desire, if you like. What, that's my driver. Um, yeah. Do I end up learning something new today? Um, you know, either because... I put two ideas together that I'd never thought of putting together or because I had to sit there and look it up the hard way uh, or because somebody just 
sort of said, oh, what about this? I've learned about this. And you go, oh, I've never come across that before. Tell me more. Um, yes, that what that thing you're saying, let's try that. Um, uh, whichever way it is, I think that all of those, that that's the driver for me. That's that's what, um, you know, either the light bulb's going on my head or somebody else's head, um, preferably both. But, you know, it's, it's, it's to do with there's something new, mm-hmm. something new that you didn't have at the beginning of the day. And at the end of the day, now you have it. Exactly. And it's, it's, I think the, the point you made right at the beginning of that, that mention there, that what makes a good developer, there's no, there's no two ways about it. You can, you can be the most intelligent person in the world with a PhD and, you know, glowing, glowing references, but, and then in, in an environment where there was a real big culture fit, you might sit there and be the sore thumb in the situation and not get along with the team and be the outsider yeah. and not blend well. And it's the wrong environment for you um and you know they could be the best developer in the world but they won't produce the best um you know the best product or the best models or data pipelines if you don't have the right you know methodologies and the right team and the right people around you and if it always comes always comes back to people environment um and there's so many factors to take into consideration on a daily basis and like you say mm. it coming out at the end of the day and everyone being happy and having learned something that's a massive milestone um and if it, that that one bit of learning could affect something don't allow along the line that can really change the, the perspective or dynamic of where that product is going and it can develop and sink bigger than anyone ever thought you just don't mm. know it's it's so interesting yeah. to see how you how, how the narrative can change in a business and you know in in that in the even the uh, software life cycle as well it, it just so much changes on a regular basis you just running with the running with the times as well and seeing where it can go but um in yeah. the work you do uh, as well there's obviously a degree of blockers that you must face from people yeah. um and what do those blockers look like um yeah I, it whew, that one varies quite a lot in terms of one of the major Obst- there's two kind of obstacles. Um, I guess no, three, three, because I'm going to include myself as being a potential blocker. In other words, I have a particular worldview, and much as I'd like to say, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm kind of uh, uh, it, 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 kind of thirsty for knowledge, you know, and uh, different ways of looking at things. I'm still human, so I've got I'm limited to my own perspective, uh, and I can only borrow so much from other people. So sometimes there's a failure of imagination on my part. You can't know everything. Um, and you can't see everything. So that might be, sometimes I'm just not seeing something. So potentially that is a blocker. I'm not helping in one way or another. Um, you know, I might be on a training course and somebody's not getting something and I am not seeing a way and I'm not seeing that they're not getting it or I'm not seeing a way that I could help them. And that's limited to my perspective. So yeah, so that's the, the I'm going to start, start closest. Uh, that's me. The next one is in other people, the people who are, um, uh, uh, learning something or, or building something. Um, normally, it is to do with um, attachment. You're very attached to the things that you have created. You're very attached to the ideas that you have. Um, you know whether that could be code. I'm attached to the code that I have written. I'm a, I, I put two years of work into this system. Clearly, I have a relationship with that. Um, I'm attached to my design ideas um, uh, uh, for this. It, there's a basic attachment, but also you may have invested, there's attachment to other aspects of your knowledge. Um, if you've invested in a particular skill and somebody is trying to show you a different way of doing something, it, potentially that's a threat. Potentially they're showing you something that could invalidate what you already know, that contradicts what you already know. And that's a kind of, naturally the body kicks in like a you know, self defense mechanism. It's just like, ah, you know what, we're going we're gonna to reject this. You know, this. Oh no no no! We 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 just done fine. We've done fine without testing at this level. No, we never test, and it's just like that's a threat to your. That's a, that's nothing to do with the uh, the technology or the objectivity of what you're doing. This is a very subjective experience that I have invested this in, in this particular way of doing something, and and that affects people very differently. Um, you know, sometimes you know, it's very difficult to stereotype people. Or rather, it's too easy to stereotype people, but it's very difficult to get people right because uh, they're more complex than stereotypes. But sometimes I find that when I am teaching something that is a more novel skill, a novel way of looking at something, so not so much a programming language side of things as a methodological thing. Um, so a, a test-driven development being a way of developing your code alongside your tests. 
um, so that you are always sure that uh, you have some confidence. Uh, of course, it's never going to be perfect, but again, perfection, that's not our department. We're human, uh, but we can do improvement. That's one thing we can do. Um, and just to give an extra element of confidence. Now, test-driven development has this particular view, not simply that one tests code, but one does it in a continuous way. Let's call it continuous testing because everything else these days has been called continuous deployment pipelines. So it's continuous everything. So yeah, continuous testing. Now, for some people, this is kind of like, yeah, this is a crazy idea. Um, you know, uh, either, hey, I'm a developer, therefore I don't test. That is for testers. I develop and they test. Um, and that's the question of perspective of um, mm. profession. That's, a, that's one another aspect. For other people, it's, well, I've never needed to do it that way. Uh, mm. Or rather, they believe they've never needed to do it that way because they've managed to progress quite, quite well in their career uh, without that. And so when I'm trying to get people thinking in this way, um, uh, then there's natural for some people, there's going to be pushback. Now, the people I'm most likely to get pushback from uh, are uh, people who've been doing software development for a very long time because they have a really, you know, they, the, the tracks are really well worn in. This is how I do things. Mm -hmm. Whereas I find uh, more likely to get people accepting of this idea, one, if they've been in an environment where they have seen it mm -hmm. and they've experienced it. Uh, or two, if they're relatively new to software development, uh, if they hold fewer preconceptions, if their tracks really haven't been dug as deeply through the years, so they're a little more open, they, they come across a little more flexible. Now, obviously, some of that is also personality, um, which is, again, another variable there that can, you know, quite happily, I've, I've taught people who are um, significantly older than me and have utterly embraced uh, this as a, uh, this relatively new way of doing things and so oh, this is great i never looked at it like this um yeah. and so i don't want to over over stereotype to people but there is this sense sometimes when you're presenting somebody with something new whether it's perspective on software architecture perspective on the technologies that they're using um or uh, the methodology then that the resistance can come from them because they have a reason they have a history um uh, to do that and then i guess the third blocker space moving out from me to the people who are kind of like, you know, if they're, if they're learning something or we're trying something out, they're either invested in their existing ideas. The next space out is the environment that they're in. Mm -hmm. And you talked just now about the environment, the context. You can be a great developer, but if the context doesn't bring it out of you, out in you, then um, it, it's that classic thing of you can have a bunch of star players, but if the environment is, is not good, then they're not really star players, which is why the star player thing is really kind of quite it's not always very helpful you're you're looking for um somebody who can fit within a context and that requires understanding the context and the person not just the person um but the context and the person and it is quite possible to have somebody who has um been uh, very capable in a previous role move to a new role in a new company uh, not get along with it at all and devalue they devalue themselves but they they're also devalued by the environment uh, and they feel that that is holding, you know, that's that's another blocker. How, uh, the environment can hold people back. It can make them not believe in themselves. And I, I visited a company a number of years ago where that was exactly the problem that I saw. I was there to talk about software architecture and, and, and code quality and stuff. Um, and when we actually hung out with the team and we looked at the code, it was very clear there was a different problem. And that was the company. It was not them. They were individually incredibly capable but the company kind of robbed them of the their self-belief uh that, that they had skills to offer because they always seem to be firefighting uh, it didn't give them the opportunity so there was a lack of belief in them and unfortunately that rumps off on people as well um, yeah. so i think that's that there's that and, and that kind of relates to another aspect which i think is again environmental uh the degree to which people are trusted to do their own thing uh, to be autonomous, um, because I think a lot of blockers, from a business point of view, I get when people are doing this. Either I'll make a suggestion, or if it's a training course, I'll offer an idea. It's like, oh, that sounds great. Now, how do I sell this to management? It's always yeah. Th there's always an us and them thing, and whenever that us and them thing rears its head, it's kind of oh, okay. That your problem is not to do with the technical side. It's to do there's a there's a there's a barrier there, and it's divided into us and them. It, you're not all in this together. Um, and there is also a power structure there, um, which is, um, you know, obviously in large organizations, you have to differentiate um, the structure of people. If you're dealing with 
companies that are tens to hundreds to thousands of people, then there is clearly a concept of role specialization to some degree. But the Mm. problem is that we end up with an authority um, structure, which actually prevents the work being done in many cases. A lot of large companies operate by preventing work happening, uh, which is a very curious, might initially sound like a very curious thing to say, but when you actually look at the inefficiencies of large companies, it's like, oh, okay, so you end up fighting the politics. You know, you can have a perfectly reasonable idea, but politics and the belief in other people um, tends to also be a bit of a block. That one's a hard one to deal with because Mm. I normally don't have a mandate to address that. Um, You know, I can address the problem where I see it and I can offer pointers and suggestions, but I don't necessarily have that, that role and influence to be able to change that. So those blockers are the hardest. And with those, with those blockers also comes myths. And I, I, I try to make sure we differentiate between the two mm. because blockers and myths can be intertwined. And I, I, I like to make them uh, be obvious that it's very clear that they are two different things. Do you find in the work you do that, is there any big myths that you want to debunk in the work you do every day? Oh, yeah, I guess. Oh, there's, there's there's quite a few because I think I think your observation is is spot on there because um, did a piece of work a few years ago and a lot of this is is actually comes down to communication. Um, uh, it's beliefs we have about other people believing on what uh, what we do, um, and and so I, I've seen this where somebody said, "Oh, well, you know, um, you know, the, the, you know, we can't give you exact estimates as to how long this work is going to take." And they felt frustrated by this expectation. Now, this happened to take place at an event, at a, at a, a kind of a, a workshop where, fortunately, I was able to we were able to actually get all the roles in the room at the same time. And right next to me was the manager. It was a product manager. He said, "I had no idea you had this problem." He said, "I don't need exact estimates." That was a myth. It turns out I don't need exact estimates. When I'm asking you for an estimate, I, I don't want to know whether it's five days or six days. Uh, or, you know, 4.3 months versus 4.8 months. You know, I, I don't care. I want to know if it's days or months. That, you know, he wanted order of magnitude. You know, he says, when I ask for this feature, am I looking at something we can have this month or am I looking at something we need to push to the back end of this year? I mean, that's, in other words, it was a, I'm not, now I'm not saying everybody, that's what everybody talks about when they talk about estimates, but it's just the very fact that this had grown up. There's an assumption, or I mean, we are really held back by our assumptions. Um, but sometimes there are the, these propagated to larger scale myths. So um, one of the ones, so there's a number of number of myths that are uh, depending on people's relationship to software development um, that I think are, are, are kind of worth um, uh, considering and reevaluating. Um, and I think one of them is uh, the idea uh, from a software. Sometimes people look at software development or software developers as that's like a manufacturing process. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, it's, it, it's very much, it, it's, it's a, software development is as much a manufacturing process as um, uh, football is. Okay. Yeah. You know, oh yeah, football, that's, that's for manufacturing goals. <laughs> well, in one yeah. sense, there is a bleak perspective where that is true, but actually <laughs> that's not really what's going on. Um, it turns out that in software development, we solve the manufacturing problem, you know, uh, in the middle of last century. Um, yeah. You know, we have, the t- we have the tools for that. Uh, we, we present a formal description of what it was, what it is that we want done. We present that to a tool, a compiler, a build, a set of build tools that yeah. that's the manufacturing bit. We, we, we solved that problem a long time ago. The manufacturing bit has been done um, and we're just getting better uh, and better. We are, we have uh, bigger pipelines and more continuous pipelines for deployment. Mm-hmm. Uh, honestly, the manufacturing thing is a solved problem compared with most, uh, with most issues. The real challenge is, what is it that we're going to build? Um, that's, it's a, in other words, it's a design problem. And in the broadest sense, it's a product design problem. It's a thinking problem. It's a problem that can't be automated. Um, you can't, it's not manufacturing, it's designing. So there is this idea that sometimes we see uh, a lot of, uh, and you know, obviously with any metaphor, Metaphors, by definition, are inaccurate and incomplete. Because if they were not, if they were perfectly accurate, then they wouldn't be a metaphor. It would be identity. That is what this is, as opposed to this is kind of like this. And we we use man, manufacturing metaphors often. Um, we use team metaphors and so on. We borrow from sports. But there is this idea that 
sometimes people say, oh, yeah, and, you know, you know, if you're going to build a large building, then you have this and you have the builders and so on. And it's just and, you know, you have the architect's firm and maybe the architect's firm uh, for a significant building will employ, uh, depending on the scale of the building, uh, between uh, uh, two and 20 people. OK, depending on the scale of the building. That's small compared to most software projects. OK, uh, uh, to many software projects, you know, two people, it, there are two people teams out there. Um, there are 20 people teams. There are also 200 people teams. And for people are thinking, oh, no, no, but building the large building, there's hundreds, if not thousands of people involved. You know, if it's a skyscraper, oh, there's all the builders. It's like, yeah, we don't have that in software. We just have the architect's firm. That is what we do. We're designing. Um, and we have the engineers firm. That's it. That, it. That's what the level is. And that kind of coordination is completely different to trying to coordinate people who are constructing things. Although we use the construction metaphor and the architecture metaphor extensively in software, it's like, no, uh, if you've got a team of 100 developers, that's not 100 manufacturers. That's not 100 people on a production line. That's 100 people who are designers. That's why yeah, that and there's a lot going on there. So that would be a kind of a fairly, a fairly typical myth. And I think that it's very easy to fall into that view sometimes from outside software development. Sometimes, um, if you've not interacted with software developers or done software development yourself, and even if you have, sometimes if you leave that in the rearview mirror for too long, it's easy to kind of fall into a much more commoditized idea yeah. of oh yeah, you just it's just a uh, it's just a simple matter of programming, and, and, and then they'll do that. It's just like yeah, but the whole point is that software development is uh, manufacturing. Let's put it this way. Um, so um, here's a mug. I got this one outside Chernobyl. Uh, uh, so two years ago, I visited the uh, exclusion zone in the Ukraine. Um, I got this outside. And you know what? This was not the only mug that they had. Um, they had lots of mugs. This is a manufacturing problem. What is manufacturing about? It's about creating identical art. It's about the elimination of variation. All of those mugs were the same. They had a big wall of mugs. I could have picked any one of them and they're all pretty much equivalent and interchangeable. Um, that problem has been solved in software development. You know, if somebody says, hey, I, I just downloaded this new Android app, I don't sit there and say, oh, I must get it. Okay, where do I get it? I need somebody to assemble the bits and bytes for me. I, it's a solved problem. I just get it from Google Play. I'm done. If as a company, I say, we need a new product, then what we're doing is we're saying we're not, we're, the goal is not to eliminate variation. We're trying to introduce variation. In other words, the goal of software development is, is exactly the opposite of manufacturing. We've solved the manufacturing problem. You know, you want a copy of that? If you want exactly the same thing that already exists in the world, that's a solved problem. We're done. If you want something that exists in the world, but actually you want it slightly different, use a different technology, connect to a different uh, uh, set of social media, um, to, be, um, uh, to be developed in this company rather than that company. We don't know how they did it uh, or whatever. You're not asking for the same thing. You're asking for something different. You're asking for something that doesn't exist in the world the way that you're expecting. So software development is about the production of, uh, production of variation, not the elimination of variation, which is why it is so filled with creativity and surprises and problem solving. So that kind of ties back to it. So that way of thinking about it, but I think many people start thinking about software development as much more commodified and, and, and um, uh, more predictable um, yeah. and manufacturing oriented than it really is. It has, clearly has those elements and clearly some of the predictability aspects are desirable, but that's not where we get them from. So it's such an interesting, interesting point that you said how it's commodified and what are many people would associate coding with per se. I'm going to use a very open example that a lot of people know about, but um, SpaceX sends their rocket into space with JavaScript. Yeah. Very common thing. And it's just like, oh, that's what JavaScript is. But you just know, you, you just throw a concept at something and saying, you know what it is. You've probably read that somewhere and you don't understand actually the, the nooks and crannies to what actually was behind that code, how it was asked, how it was articulated and how it was formulated into a into a pipeline to allow it to be used in a more effective way. And it's just yeah. like to get it hang on, to get a rocket to land on, 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 free, pe on free pegs on, on, the, on the ground, there's a whole methodology that's got into place to get to that po point with trials. And, and then for mm -hmm. someone to just say, oh, they use JavaScript to do that. It's like, no, 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 no. There's so much more they did than just JavaScript. And it's just, it's, you want to shake people sometimes when you're trying to, exp uh, when they, they just generalize a topic so much. And it's so interesting when you say from the outside yeah. in, when you commodify it too much, what you get is, it's just saturation, I think, in a way. And people just go, oh, it's that. That, that, yeah. makes, that makes sense. And it's just yeah. like, you have no 
further concept about what he actually they're talking about than just that. Um, and that, that really brings into my question, which is, yeah, this is a bit of a tangent, actually, um, of a question. But for everything you've done in like, the consultancy side over the last 20 years, you obviously have come through every walk of life, every challenge. You've seen, you've seen different perspectives as you've gone along. Do you find, for all the blockers, uh, for all the, those that you've helped, um, what advice would you have given to yourself 20 years ago? Ah, right. Yeah, that's an interesting one because um, I think that's going to be a very, that's going to be a much more personal one in that sense. The one thing I would say in that case, because, um, because software development is so um, driven, there's such demand mm -hmm. um, for it. It's, it's, it's not a, uh, it, it, some, from one perspective, it undergoes permanent skill shortage. Um, uh, and because you know, software runs the world and eats the world, uh, and sometimes spits out the world. Um, it, there, it's it's there's always push. There's it's not something that has um, ever really truly experienced a proper slump uh, compared to many other professions and disciplines. The, what does that mean from an individual perspective? It means there's a lot of there can be if you're not careful a lot of pressures can mount up. Um, and I, I'm just gonna put it there that um, that the, the one piece of advice uh, I would offer myself when I was younger is like um you know don't let yourself burn out um just don't um uh working harder is not always the best way to get work done um that's 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 one of the uh that's that's one of those kind of like you know wisdom with age type things is honestly there's a there's there's a whole load of uh you know um there are there are weeks if not months that i would be able to reclaim from my past if I'd known this and it's just like, actually now would be a really good time to go home. Um, you know, just, just, uh, because I'm not going to solve this at this level because, um, that's the point. It's a problem solving thing. It's not a manufacturing thing. It's a problem solving thing. And that requires this. And, um, honestly, if you are stuck doing something and you've dug yourself into that level, um, then if you haven't solved it yet, then doing more of the same, you know, this is one of those kind of classic kind of, kind of uh, sort of signs of, uh, uh, of losing, losing your uh, sense of reality is mm -hmm. if you haven't solved it doing it this way so far, and you put a lot of this into it, what makes you think more of the same is going to say, you need to do something different. You need less of the same. That's what you need. You need to give your brain a break. Um, and I, I found, in fact, I ended up with one job where I used to call these the slip road moments. And the reason I call these slip road moments it's because I would eventually, I'd stop work, I'd get in the car, drive home, and just as I joined the motorway on the slip road, the solution would normally appear, which is actually a high risk, a high risk option because you know, you're about to join a fast flowing stream of traffic. But more to the point, it's at this point, you've just let it all go. Your brain is now free. It's no longer doing this linear thinking. You were chipping away at whatever problem you were doing. And guess what? You, what you actually need to do is let the pressure off. Um, Spending another two hours there doing more of the same did not, won't actually solve it. Going and doing something else, and then suddenly you realize, oh, that's easy. I'm done. Five minutes. The next morning, what looked like two or three hours work, you walk in ten minutes, you're done. But also another point there is that typing. Uh, I, 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 it's a phrase I coined in the late '90s. Typing is not the bottleneck in software development, and yet sometimes that's how people tend to view it. It's like, oh, you know, we need to type more. It's like that's not the problem. Um, the, sometimes it's code generation tools. Um, I'm not saying code generation is bad, but automatic code generation tools, normally the way that um, product vendors would target these, and they did this all the way into the 2000s, they'd say, oh, well, this generates you know, 50,000 lines of code automatically and does this. And it's just like, yeah, but that's not actually the problem, is it? It's not a typing problem. That's not what we're experiencing. Um, you know, these developers don't need to type more. In fact, they probably need to type less. They probably need to slow down. They don't need to speed up. They need to slow down. You actually need to stop them typing and get them thinking. Um, and that idea that this is, is an element of creativity and also deleting things. So, you know, sometimes you worked on something and then you think, yeah, that's not the best way to do it. I've got a better way of doing it. And yeah. that, so for me, I think that the, the, the classic overtime culture um, and pushing towards deadlines is detrimental to uh, quality is detrimental to business value. Um, it's also detrimental to personal uh, from a personal point of view. I would tell you know I would tell myself, you know, 
watch out for this in yourself, but also watch out for it in uh, other people around you and see its signs and just try and, if you can, put the brakes on it and go, maybe we don't go down this road. Maybe we go down this road. So funny that you've just... I believe in the universe. It's so funny you've literally just said that the, that that whole section there, and uh, it, having experienced burnout re- very recently, um, too much responsibility uh, on myself. You, but you commit too much to just go, 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 and you're not stopping. Um, the last six months have been the probably the craziest six months of my life, to be honest. Um, so it, I can't believe we're now nearly halfway through June, and it's like, wait, what? What's going on? Um, and <laughs> what I'm, happened? Yeah, I know. It's just I've just blinked and it's like another year. Um, and I, I noticed recent, very, very recently that I was going and going and going and I wasn't giving myself the time to actually slow down to speed up. And I think if you if you send yourself to a point of just being a vegetable, you're as useful as the vegetable, you know, and it's in that analogy. Mm-hmm. It's the point that when you push yourself too far, then you're you're, you're as useful you know there's no use to yourself let alone anyone else that you work with and yeah it's about acknowledging it very early on and if you can acknowledge it earlier the better um and that's yeah. what I've done. I, I noticed a couple of big things that I, I had to get addressed quickly uh i'm not gonna say it's to happen it's gonna change overnight but at least i'm aware of it now and i need to spend yeah. the time just looking after myself and doing the things that i want to do and i noticed that i was neglecting all the things the the not the social side, but the self side. I was neglecting that, and that's allowed me to get to where I am today. And that's fine to be in this state. But in the same sense, I was like, okay, where do I, where do I see myself to get to that next milestone, to get to that next goal? What do I need to do to look after myself to make sure I get there? And now, I, you know, you've got to take the brakes off sometimes. Um, and yeah. at the same time, you've got to put the brakes on sometimes. It's the same. It's a, it's a double edged sword, isn't it? Yeah, it's. I think it. I think it is. I think it's, it's exactly what you're saying, and you made a it made a really good point there about taking on too much responsibility. That sometimes we spread ourselves too thin, and so therefore things that would otherwise be simple feel overwhelming because we are. It, it's uh, sometimes the way of looking at it is you know you're trying to keep too many plates in the air. You know you got you got plates on sticks, and they're, they're spinning around. It's just like yeah. you, something's going to drop, and sometimes uh, we focus on the outward facing ones and we neglect the inward facing ones. In other words, ourselves. The you know it's it's a case of if uh so the other week i drove um so i'm based in bristol the other week i drove up to edinburgh mm-hmm. uh to record a uh, a talk so actually the first time i've been on a stage in 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 over a year granted there wasn't an audience there but it was for a pre-record you know they said we, we want to run the event uh the edinburgh science festival and they said we want to run the event but we're going to do it online but we don't want just people sitting there doing zoom talks uh we want to kind of like you know more BBC or TED Talk style setup. So we'll do recording. So we'll do pro. And I just, I leapt at the opportunity, the idea of actually, well, one, just driving for, I, I just thought, you know what, I'm going to drive. I've got, I've got time. I've got time and space. I'm going to drive. Uh, it's like, uh, it, it, it's six and a half hours. Um, and I did that. But one of the things that, um, it, one of the things that I think that is, was kind of interesting um, about that was the, uh, the the whole driving experience? The whole driving experience is that uh, somebody said, "Isn't that a long way?" And it's just like, "Well, yeah." And it's like, "Yeah, it is." But what else was I going to? And I said, "I've got a number of choices." Um, given that all most flights have been cancelled, I said, "I can I can go to I can go to Bristol Airport and I can wait around a long time. I can go. You know, it's going to be slower going through the airport than it used to be." I'm arrive and I've got the other end. And, and I said, I'm, I'm going to be spending my time like that, or I'm going to be on a train and that, that's fine up to a point, but again, t- train times. Were, and I thought, if I do this, then if I t- spend a whole day just driving, then I get to see some stuff that I have not otherwise see, uh, seen and I get to enjoy it. So that's the first thing is that actually I wasn't really worried about how long it took. Um, first of all, slow down in order. So I actually enjoy driving in a way that I don't think I've ever enjoyed before. Um, so first of all, give yourself a bit of time. That actually... It, it's the slow down to speed up thing. It's yeah. just like I, I arrived actually surprisingly refreshed. It's like, oh, I really enjoyed it. I uh, stopped off to see my son at uni- he's in university in Sheffield. And it's just like, let's make a day of it. Let's do something. Let's yeah. have a slow day. Even though I'm driving on motorways, let's have a slow day. But the other thing I need to do, obviously, is I need to stop and get petrol. And this is the thing that we always forget is that like somebody says, oh no, we need to really just push on. It's just like, yeah, the car's going to run out of petrol and it's got a little meter. And human beings, we don't come with convenient little uh, uh, gas gauges that tell us, guess what? You're running on empty. 
you know, you've got to stop every now and then. If you actually want to make the trip, you need to stop either because you are tired or because you need fuel. Uh, you can't need fuel or you need fuel. Um, it's all of these things in order to get, in order to fulfill the bigger picture, to do the whole journey, you've got to take a break um, and, and, and learn how to enjoy that and then just push a few other things out of the way. So there were a couple of things I had scheduled in for that day. And I thought, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enjoy this in a way I haven't done. Now, the interesting thing is that I got back being absolutely great, really enjoyed it. And I thought, you know what, there's a lot more I could actually apply from this brief experience um, to, to, to other things because I intentionally cleared out some space. Mm-hmm. And just, you know, uh, and it was that was, you know, the, the, as you said, there's this idea of like you need to look after yourself at some point. And I wasn't thinking in those terms, but that's actually mm-hmm. the side effect of having to do all of this. It was just like, oh, I, f- I feel much better. And it's just like, uh, you know, and uh, when I came back, I had to do some work. Uh, there was a whole, I found that so much. It was just like, it was the lightest thing in the world. Whereas previously, earlier in the week, it felt like that was going to be the heaviest thing in the world. Yeah. But it's just like, oh, it was me. It wasn't the thing. It was me. And I think that that is sometimes what weighs us down. Yeah. And that classic problem of burnout is that we are looking in the world and we're seeing weight, but actually the weight, it's us. You know, we're just taking, we've taken on too much and we, we're trying to juggle too many things. And once you give yourself or are somehow able to give yourself that space or that break, suddenly things become doable. They become possible. Things become clearer. Oh, I need to do this, but I don't need to do that. So let me shove that to one side, yeah. deprioritize that. Um, you know, I can see it now rather than letting it reach crisis point. You were talking about that awareness. That really is one of the first things. So yeah, yeah, I think that's very important. And it, in all of that as well, um, you've made so many good points there. To, you've, off the back of what I've said, you've kind of put the nail, nail in the coffin, to be honest. And this also comes into, with, with anything happening in burnout, there's always people that motivate us and keep us going. And my question to you is, we're all influenced by people in life, I believe, um, whether that be family, friends, inspirational people, famous people, we've all got our own. And I'd be interested to know who who are your influential people in your life that have helped you you know to keep going and keep moving on keep putting one foot in front of the other who would those people be that's a, yeah that's a that's a that's a difficult question because i don't normally think in those terms but i'm gonna okay so i'm gonna start again i'm gonna start closest to me um uh as we're talking family my wife um carolyn um actually she i she's got a we are not necessarily alike um, which I think is a great thing. Um, so, so when I look to her, I see a very different approach in life, a very different way of solving problems and dealing with situations. And she has a very, I, I would regard myself as being a little more erratic. Um, um, uh, sometimes, yeah, really good, really, really kind of like manic, really on, and then sometimes not. And she's much more consistent and she has a, a, a very good grasp of objectivity. So um, there's kind of, in that sense, uh, obviously there's the personal relationship aspect, there's always an anchor there, but actually, from another point of view, in terms of a, a a role model, somebody I can look at and say there is something, an attitude I could learn from. Doesn't mean I do, but if there is an attitude I could learn from or a point of view. It's just like, yeah, okay, that that's helpful. Um, I find that you know, that changes the way I do things, or it helps moderate or bring an objectivity to a situation that I might not otherwise have. Mm-hmm. Um, but but in specific professional space, I think there's a in terms of opportunities and the way that people not necessarily help me directly, but I, if I look back and I start thinking in terms of people I have interact, interacted with um, and known over the years, people I've looked forward to seeing, but then I can also say, you know what, I, I, this, this made a difference, um, mm-hmm. the, the uh, life outlook, um, but also knowledge, things that I've learned uh, from. They just drop these little pearls of wisdom or led me to a situation where that's occurred. Um, one of the um, uh, people I pick on is uh, Russell Winder, who, who sadly passed away earlier this year. And he was, he was a member of many different communities. I, um, uh, in, in software development, he, he was, um, uh, one of the things about Russell is he was fascinated by anything and everything. Uh, you never knew what he was up to. And you, you know, he, he, you'd turn up and he'd be talking, uh, he'd picked up a new programming language and he'd be somehow deeply involved in the community of that programming language. And then he'd just be drawing parallels or 
insights or observations. Um, he'd ask questions. He had a, a deep experience, but it was also very broad uh, experience. He, um, the way I put it to somebody, is that he he made knowing stuff kind of cool. You know, it wasn't rather it wasn't stuffy. It was okay to know stuff and be excited yeah. about it. So he's kind of your. Um, I honestly had more passion for salt. He had more passion for new stuff than uh, many people um, who are just entering the field. Um, I, uh, it was, you know, uh, and uh, he was, you know, very much at the other end of his career. And it's just like, yeah. So I, I found that and his, his worldview um, uh, uh, particularly infectious um, and kind of related to him. It's another, uh, another chap uh, through the same kind of user groups, a um, mm. uh, guy, uh, uh, Francis Glasper, uh, that who, when I look back, I also recognize that I, in conversation with him, I ended up, he's part of one of the reasons I ended up writing a lot. Mm -hmm. um, the um, the uh, ACCU organization, I, I wrote, a, uh, I've written a lot for it over the years. But I, sometimes it was conversations that we would have that would inspire me. It's just like, okay, I need to make this clearer. So I would then write something and then that would be, that would, that would kind of take yeah. that somewhere. And he also went to yeah. conferences, he was involved in, uh, 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 kind of language, programming language standards panels and stuff like that. So I, I got involved ultimately through his connection. Um, and so it was, it was that kind of by association kind of idea. And similarly, there's another chap, Alan O'Callaghan. He was a, a lecturer at De Montfort University. And what I liked about um, a, a, a number of years ago, I used to run a number of um, uh, uh, workshop sessions with Alan. And I still find I'm referring back to those. Um, Actually, it's no uh, many, funny. many years on, you know, and he, because yeah. he, he, he also brought huge different perspectives um, onto things like software architecture, uh, knowledge, but, you know, always yeah, at various conferences go out drinking with him, but he always offered a different insight. And he was one of these people who came from a very different space. You know, his background is history and politics. And he yeah. came into software development and he looked at it from, for, for me, it was a much fresher perspective. I was a classic technologist, kind of engineering, science-y kind of guy. Um, and he looked at it from a perspective of, yeah, but what, what, what people have a history. People mm. relate in a particular way. We call that politics. What does that mean for software development? It's just like, oh, that. So mm. that really transformed that. And I guess the last person I'm going to pick on here um, is Linda Rising. She, um, uh, I met her through um, uh, sort of, again, kind of a software development community. Uh, the design patterns community. And she has a, a long background. Um, uh, she was involved in the Boeing 777 software. Um, and she's got this kind of you know, strong technical background. But then she's really, she, she opens out into this much broader space, which is that of understanding, okay, how do people connect? What's the science behind what people do and don't do? Um, and she's genuinely interested in, I guess, the, the, the making the world a better place. In other words, compassion, okay, it's fine to be compassionate and in software development. It's yeah. fine to, so what I learned from a lot of these people was not just the opportunity in the technical side of things, but also, uh, yeah, it's okay to do people stuff. Um, and it's okay to be kind, compassionate, um, yeah. and to take interest in all of these things, and also to connect ideas from other fields together. So yeah. I think that, that that for me has been the, uh, the big lesson. It's amazing. It's near the six degrees of separation. It's funny because I know Alan um, through I went to, I went to Montfort University. Oh. My background is in, <laughs> my background is international relations, and I know him from history and politics because he knows Alistair Jones, who is my lecturer. Um, so yeah, small small world. No, yeah, he, that is a small world. Oh, good grief! Yeah, yeah. no, How brilliant funny. guy. Um, I've met him a few times. He's uh, no, some really. She shared some very valuable insight in my early. In my well, my late teens, but it was like my early twenties when I got to know him because I, um, when I was doing my, my thesis, I was looking into uh, Cambridge Analytica and uh, oh, yeah. the data side of it, and I was, I was taught. I remember I approached him about um, how how I could potentially work. There was a lot of politics around ethics about using going to Cambridge yeah. Analytica and talking. And then about two weeks before I'm about to get approval, there was a police raid and I was just like, oh, no, it's like I can't do anything. Um, so data, data and data science and that side of the coin, uh, I'm having a lot of interesting conversations in the early stage of my last, uh, in my thesis. Um, it was like a very, it was some, most, mainly email conversations, but we did have a chat about where I wanted to go. I ended up doing a deep analysis of Donald Trump's Twitter account. Um, 
where I analysed 4,000 tweets and put them into a, um, I put them into a, I, I, if I'd known more about data science in that side of the world, I would have dabbled in NLP. I would have done some proper data pipelines, data modelling, yeah. uh, done some actual integrated NLP models that can detect certain languages that Trump used. And yeah. I could have made a very elaborative um, project, but at the time and not my, my extent of, coding was very limited and I, I wasn't willing to do it in r because r is as, as far as once you know r it's very straightforward but it was just getting to grips with it i just said you know what it's not going to be worth worth the time i need something that's more extensive um but again that's the my work is the founding blocks for someone um who wants to go on to do that so it's there's at least something to be used there but i digress small world but um my yeah. my last my last question to kind of bring it in full house because we discussed yeah. So many different topics that we've kind of dabbled into, and it's it's always great to see how we can take the conversation. It, it never goes one way. Um, and off the back of those people who have influenced you throughout your life to what you do today, do from all the advice you've been given and you give out, what my one question is, and it comes from Richard Reed, who wrote a book. If I could only tell you one thing, so uh, Kevin, if you could tell me one thing, what would it be? In addition to the thing that I sold myself, would have would tell would tell myself, um, is because obviously if you ask me this next week, I could probably give you a different answer. But it's uh, I'm going to choose something that actually has come up a few times, um, or a point of view that I I found myself expressing mm. within family to friends uh, and uh, and others recently is an idea of um, uh, don't don't wait till a magic future to do something. In other words, don't keep putting things off. And I don't, I'm not talking about so much sort of carpe diem or anything like that. Mm. I'm talking about the idea that sometimes people have a, a life plan um, and, and, and they say, right, okay, well, we're going to do this, this is going to work really hard. And then, and then at this point, I'm going to, I don't know, retire early or I'll do this. And then, they, and it's kind of like, first of all, we don't know, you know, that that's one of the things we don't know uh, is, is uh, uh, when are we going to die? We, we don't have a good answer to that question. So you can't predict that. So why are you going to predict anything else? But the other thing is, what are you going to do between now and that point? Um, you're going to be, are you just biding your time? Um, uh, uh, you're going to become a particular person by the time you get there. And the, this is something I've seen in a number of people, um, not everybody who's uh, necessarily retired early, but in a number of people who have either retired when they expected to or retired early, is that they have reached that. And they are not the person that they were when they started this whole, you know, work life journey. Um, and the thing is that you become, uh, you, you practice to become the person you will be. And when do you practice? Every day by being, you know, what you do every day is yeah. ultimately who you become. So if your ambition is to write the great novel when you, um, uh, when you retire, unless you're writing now, that is not going to happen. You're going to reach that and you're going to find yourself twiddling your thumbs. Uh, and and I, I think for me, I was really reminded of something. I worked, uh, I did a contract many years ago in the city and somebody there and she was working, you know, every hour and she was, you know, on contractor, contractor rates in the city. It was just like through the roof. Um, and she was very much driven by money. Uh, but, you know, that was her plan. She said, right, I'm going to retire early. Um, and, you know, and I remember thinking, but what do you do now? And, so, and what I eventually learned was pretty much nothing. And I said, right, that person is now suddenly going to run off the edge of a precipice. And it's kind of like, well, what do I do now? They're, you know, yeah. all those ideas that you may have had, you have become a very different person in that time. You become the person that you are by doing whatever it is that you do every day. And there's this idea that people sometimes hold, whether it is, you know, I'll take a sabbatical, whether it's I'm going to retire. The point is that the person who's going to take that is the person that, that's kind of here now, plus a bunch of experiences, depending yeah. on whether that's a year yeah. or 10 years or 20 years or whatever. What's that going to? What's that going to make? Which? What's that going to cause you to become? Okay, yeah. you are going to become a particular person by doing those things. If yeah. you, you want to write the great novel, you need to be writing that now. All yeah. the only difference is going to be time, but your attitude needs to come from now. If you want that attitude to be real, and that's a real ambition, you need to do that one now. You, sure, you may have more time, but that's not the problem. Time is not the problem here. Um, and that, that's what you need to be doing. If, you know, if your ambition is to, oh, I'm going to spend a lot more time on the garden. If you're not already gardening, now would be a really good time because otherwise you're going to discover, oh, maybe I don't want to do the garden. I had an idea as a young, I have romanticized it. And that's the point. We 
are easily prone to romantic notions of the future. Unless you try and ground it in the present, um, then uh, the future is going to be, uh, the future is always a surprise, but this one might not be such a good surprise. Future may give you some time, it may also take away time. But if you have an ambition that you harbor now, then now is a good time to get your feet wet. You know, it doesn't mean you have, you know, that, that's, that's, that's the best time to do it. Um, and that, you know, we're so good at procrastinating and putting things off. And sometimes we procrastinate actively and busily. You know, there's a lot of people I, who would be surprised that I would say, oh, this is procrastination. Like, oh, no, I'm, I'm going, I'm, you know, down, I'm pushing my way up the company. I'm working really hard. Or it's like, yeah, that's procrastinating. If your real goal was to do all this other stuff, you're procrastinating because yeah. you're avoiding doing that. The person that needs to be doing that is not the person that's going up the company. Um, it, 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 you know, the person that that person, you, get, you don't, don't bury them. You yeah. may find that you arrive at the destination is not the destination you'd hoped. Exactly that. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing everything that you shared today. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Honestly, I've, we've discussed so much. Guys, I hope you've taken so much value from this week's episode. Um, Kevin, thank you again for coming on to the podcast. Really, really do appreciate thank it. Thank you very much, Rich. Anytime. Guys, tune in next week where we take someone else down the road with the Purpose Podcast, and I will see you all again very soon. Take care for now.